What a singular delight to have a very special guest with us tonight for a book talk. But first, I want to ask every Brooklyn Law School student who's present right now to raise their hand. All right. Every Brooklyn Law School student who's present right now, before you leave, make sure you pick up a book that the law school will buy for you. And if you hang around at the conclusion, we'll ask uh, the chief judge to sign your book for you. And don't thank me. You can thank the Board of Trustees and our generous alumni that make things like little things like that possible. Uh, I really recommend that you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and not just put it on your shelf in your law practice or maybe in your, where's Joe? in your congressional office, or <laughs> where's Anthony? Yes, Anthony, oh, he's right there in the mayor's office, you know, next to your Brad pictures. But you read the book because it's extraordinary. Now, this is a very impressive turnout for the first night of the World Series. And I promise you, we'll get you all out <laughs> in time to watch the Mets win game one. <laughs> I have, Marlon and I have admired Chief Judge Robert A. Katzman for a long time. And you know, that's not just something you take for granted because at Yale, when we were there, I was completely taken by him and also enormously impressed. He seemed to be everywhere. His intellect seemed to be double that <laughs> mere mortal. And it wasn't for a real long time that I discovered that he has a brother who was also there, who to this day I cannot tell apart from him. <laughs> uh, so Bob is a giant, but he's, there was a reason why he seemed twice uh, mere mortals. In fact, you don't know this, but at a reunion about a year ago, I was talking to Gary, and after about five minutes, he said, oh, you think that you're talking to Bob, don't you? <laughs> and it's true. Uh, as well as I know them, it's, it's very difficult for me to tell them apart, but they're both great. Both judges. Uh, I certainly admired him uh, during the time I worked with Senator Moynihan. Uh, Bob Katzman had probably one of the closest and enduring intellectual relationships uh, of anybody I know who's still living with the great Senator Moynihan. And I admired him even though it was somewhat annoying when every once in a while Moynihan would say, really? What does Katzman think? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm in awe and admire him tremendously even though I'm incredibly jealous and envious that although he has a little bit of a day job, he's managed to write what I guarantee will, is already on its way to becoming a classic in American law, that every lawyer, not just somebody who's interested in politics or government or legislation, that every lawyer should read, and I believe that many will. It is an extraordinarily unique book that is muscular while being incredibly slender and eloquently written. The scope and depth of the book is stunning when you realize that it is such a thin tone, not a word wasted. Chapter 2, for example, has the audacity to describe the lawmaking process and describes how Congress was intended and designed to operate, how in reality it operates and how it's changed, and why legislative history is written, and the realities of the modern pressures on members of Congress. 
in 12 pages. And Bob, you've got it right. <laughs> Chapter 3 describes how the legislature, Congress, interacts with agencies, the executive branch, and how they talk to each other, and how they have a common objective of making laws work and enforcing the laws. And he does that in five pages. Chapter four, he turns to the central issue of the book, which is how do courts interpret laws? How do they give meaning to the words that are written into the statute? And in this chapter, he lays out cogently and incredibly even-handedly the two mainstream thoughts. One is, is that it's appropriate for courts, in fact, not only useful, but necessary for courts, to look beyond the mere words and to consider appropriate uh, and reliable accompanying materials, that is, legislative history, in order to identify what is the purpose of the statute. And he gives many examples of why that is necessary, and it's not possible simply to rely on the words. Then he talks in a very straightforward and re revealing way, in a very honest way, about the, those who uh, adhere to the textualist view that you should stick to the words, the pure words. And he lays that out in a way in that chapter that I don't think has been done anywhere else as well or as clearly. He sets the table. Chapter 5, he does an incredibly bold thing in discussing, as a sitting judge, three cases that he has decided. And this really is a marker for Chief Judge Katzman's intellectual integrity, intellectual honesty, because he lays this out in such a straightforward, even-handed way, where he picks three cases where the outcomes are different, and as the courts move up through the court system and ultimately to the Supreme Court, the interpretations of the textualists and the word that I cannot pronounce, purposivis, purposivis, <laughs> Katzman's camp, <laughs> how the outcomes differ and leaves it to the reader to decide which is best. And in the sixth and final chapter between his very eloquent conclusion uh, Judge Katzman does something which academics, which he is, and uh, often judges don't do, but he lays out specific proposals, concrete practical proposals for how judges might interpret laws better and how Congress might do better in writing legislative history that is more uh, reliable and easy to understand. So with that overview, view of what is an incredible, tremendous book. And I say this again, I mean, when I see a thin book like this that has such an impact, it makes me think of Grant Gilmore's Ages of American Law or books of that kind. I, I don't think, you know, I've been known to embellish a little bit, but in this <laughs> case, I think I'm, you know, you didn't have to laugh that easy. <laughs> I think I am understating uh, the regard that this fine book is gonna have uh, among a very widespread so with that, uh, I think we'll just start a little bit and uh, ask Bob a biographical question. Uh, and that, that is, you know, we, we know that you're the only sitting judge who has a PhD in political scientist. I, by the way, I find it amusing that all the press and everything always describes you as a trained political scientist. What is a trained political scientist? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like a performing seal or something. <laughs> or, or, or that somehow you could bring you indoors because you, well, and it, it just, I don't understand that, but a trained political scientist who's worked most recently before becoming a judge uh, as the Walsh Professor of Government, Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University, uh, and he's held a number of major you know, research posts and so on, uh, and now he's uh, one of the top judges in the entire country. So. How 
does, how did you become a judge, uh, given your unique background? How did that all happen? Well, first, uh, uh, Nick, Dean, uh, and Marla, uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I, uh, just to be a little autobiographical uh, myself, I have uh, admired Nick Allard for, for decades. And uh, he was in law school a little ahead of me uh, when my brother was in law school. And, and Nick Allard, uh, as a student, was known for his, his brilliance. Uh, and uh, just his, not just his intellectual uh, brilliance, but just his uh, energy uh, and vitality. And uh, I've watched and admired his, his career in, uh, in government. Uh, and indeed, the fact that he has said these kind words means especially a lot to me because of the experience that he's had, the unique experience that uh, Dean Allard has had uh, on Capitol Hill uh, in Washington as a, uh, a leading lawyer. Uh, and what a, a brilliant uh, choice on the part of uh, Brooklyn Law School to have him here in this way. Uh, the, the name Nick Allard is uh, a name that not just my brother and I know, but um, several years ago I was talking to my sister, uh, who's a Princeton graduate and uh, is very active in alumni affairs. And I uh, asked her about the, the people that she was uh, working with, and uh, she singled out uh, Nick as somebody who was incredibly generous uh, and a real leader. Uh, and so uh, it means more to me than you know, I can say that you would well, invite me here. Uh, in terms of uh, my own biography on how I became a judge, a lot of it is, uh, is luck. Uh, and um, really, my, my luck is that um, when I was 21 years old and I was uh, studying for my PhD orals at, uh, at Harvard, I took a um, tutorial from someone who one day would become uh, a United States Senator, uh, Senator Moynihan. And uh, I was then later his, his teaching assistant and worked on all kinds of projects with him over the years uh, while I was in Washington on a, a pro bono basis. Um, and so w without him, I would not have this uh, job. And then other lucky circumstances. Uh, I had uh, a good friend, uh, Gene Sperling, who was uh, working in the White House at the time. And I had also done uh, a variety of projects with the uh, uh, judiciary committees, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Hatch was uh, really uh, quite wonderful, Senator Leahy. So I was really quite, quite lucky. I'd been in Washington for uh, 18 years, uh, working at the uh, Brookings Institution uh, and at, at Georgetown. And so uh, it was really the, the uh, a lot of luck that, that, that got me to this, this job. And I say this because I, I often look around and I see lots of people and I say to myself, what a great judge this person would be. And what's the difference between that person who's not a judge and me? I, uh, at the age of 21, there was somebody who, for whatever reason, took uh, a liking to me and then uh, you know, helped me uh, champion me uh, in, the, in the future. So uh, uh, I think the, the training that I got, the work, the studying that I got, a sort of um, the background that I've had has made me very interested in the work of institutions. How do institutions work or not work? How do they work together or not work together? And it's been kind of a, uh, really a driving theme in terms of the, the projects that I've, I've worked on ov over the years. Uh, and I'm especially interested in, in uh, sort of interbranch relations. 
Um, and so um, this, this book is, in a, in a sense, flows from that, that work. Well, it's a very constant theme, this idea of how to make governance work better and also the relationship between the different parts of the government. So nevertheless, a lot has been written about legislative history and legislative interpretation. Why this book now? I mean, what, what prompted you to write this book? What uh, uh, prompted me to, to write the book, I had first done it in, in a lecture form, much shortened form uh, uh, at NYU. They invited me to give a talk. And um, we should do that. And then I, I'd love to come. I'd love to come at any point. And then really what happened, uh, Nick, is that I was another fortuitous thing. I was having uh, lunch with uh, Adam Liptak of the New York Times, who had read the, uh, the lecture. And he said, have you ever thought of uh, uh, turning this into a book? And I said, no. And he said, lectures are nice, but nobody ever reads uh, lectures, and um, why don't you think about writing something that tries to be more accessible to an audience of, of interested uh, citizens, and why don't you think about even uh, writing about some of the cases that have already been decided, so there's no question about um, what you might be able to say. Um, so that was the impetus for writing the book. Um, when I looked at the literature, and, there, and there's uh, some tremendous uh, scholars in this field of how do you interpret words here at, uh, at Brooklyn uh, Law School. Larry, raise your hand. Uh, and uh, uh, what I found in the, in, in, in the literature from my perspective was that while there was quite a lot in the literature about how courts should interpret um, statutes. Uh, what was missing in, in the literature, uh, for the most part, was uh, understanding how Congress actually works, how it functions, and uh, what uh, those who write the laws, how do they think that uh, courts should interpret their work. So what I wanted to do, drawing upon the political science uh, go interest in, in government, was to um, write a book that um, talked about how Congress works. And I'm very grateful to you, Nick, for not only reading the book, but des de describing the various <laughs> parts of it. Because if you'll notice, as you listen to the dean speak, uh, courts come in really at the end of the book, uh, towards the end of the book. The first part of the book is about how Congress works. The second part of the book is how agencies, who are the first interpreters of statutes, and actually in the legislative process, what, you, what, what one notices is that when legislators write laws, they are thinking most immediately, for, in, for the most part, in terms of, of the agencies who are supposed to implement the law. Sometimes they think about the courts and how courts are going to, to interpret them. But uh, uh, as Judge Napolitano knows, that usually when laws are, are, are written, the first focus isn't, well, what are the courts going to do, but who are those, what, what are those who are going to interpret the laws in the first instance going to do, and that's those are the administrators. So first is the Congress, then it's the administrative uh, agencies, and then it's it's the courts. And I think that uh, try, what I'm trying to do is is to suggest the humility that all of us as judges should have about our roles and the respect with which we should uh, should, should accord to the legislative branch and trying to think about what it is that um, they think is, is, is important. And well, humility is not the word that comes to mind when thinking of the chief proponent of the textualist approach. <laughs> and so, in fact, are you, who was a great and very revered guest here,
uh, a year ago. Judge Napolitano brought him and interviewed him. How, to what extent are you reacting to Justice Scalia's textualist dogma? I think that, uh, that Justice Scalia is, is perhaps one of the foremost uh, uh, intellects in the law in thinking about how to interpret statutes. And um, there is much that, that I agree with. That is the idea that the text should be the first focus of how we understand um, the statute. Um, I also agree with the, the idea that the job of the judge is not to uh, inject his or her own preferences in understanding the words of the statute. Uh, where the disagreement uh, with textualism is, from my point of view, is that when the words of the statute are uh, ambiguous, what do you look to in terms of trying to understand what the statute means? And so um, the pure textualist view would say that um, legislative history is, is illegitimate. My view is there is a hierarchy of legislative history, and there are some limited sources that can be useful. For example, the conference committee report at the end that accompanies a bill, which basically describes what it is that the legislators were trying to do, uh, representing the deal, um, is useful. And the committee reports can be useful. Everything else is, and markups, if you ha can have access to them, can be useful. Everything else, I would agree, is, uh, you know, I would approach with, uh, as Justice Ginsburg put it once, hopeful um, skepticism. So, um, in the book, I've got a page from an actual law. And when you look at that law, you have no sense of what the words mean. Yeah, the, the Hobby statute, Protection the Act. The Hobby Protection Act. You cannot, uh, you cannot make heads or tail of it without reference to an accompanying legislative history. So um, what really cinches it for me is that the legislators themselves and the staffers themselves view legislative history as the single most important interpretive material in trying to understand what Congress has in mind. And what's also important to keep in mind is that this view in Congress is bipartisan. It is a view that Republicans and Democrats both have. And there's now empirical scholarship by uh, Abby Gluck and uh, Lisa uh, 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 Bressman um, that um, confirms this. If you look, and I point this out in the, in, 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 in the book, Nick, that uh, every hearing, Supreme Court hearing, Senator Grassley will say, I have great, whoever is the nominee, I have great respect for, for Justice Scalia. I agree with him on so much, but there is one area where I disagree, and that is legislative history. And then he'll go on to say, Senator Grassley will, that legislative history is something that we in Congress spend some time with. And I guess what he's really saying is that as a matter of a priori decision making, why would you necessarily absolutely disregard it. It may be that it can be, once you look at it, you might say, as we often do as judges, this isn't, this isn't of any help, or it's of limited help. But when you're in the task of judging, and when you have an unclear statute, and it's ambiguous, what you as a judge should be trying to do is to try to think of what can be helpful so that when you interpret those ambiguous words, you are coming as close to what the legislature had in mind. And if you don't look at the materials that Congress itself thinks is important, 
when it writes the laws, then all you're left with really are these ambiguous words. And that, I think, can lead to judicial activism. If I have an ambiguous statute and I'm just looking at it and I'm not looking at what's helpful, that, then I am, you know, I'm running the risk that even if I'm trying the best I can to interpret the, the statute sensibly, that unmoored from the reality of the legislative process, I'm going to do something that Congress really didn't, uh, didn't have in mind. Well, you know, that prompts a question. By the way, for, for those of you who are wondering, um, in his book, uh, Chief Judge Katzman describes the Hobby Protection Act, 15 U.S.C., Section 2101 at SEC, which states, is amended in Section 2, a, in subsection B, by inserting, quote, or the sale in commerce after, quote, distribution in commerce. B, by redesigning subsection D as subsection E and inserting after subsection C the following, quote, D, provision of assistance or support. It shall be a violation of subsection A or B for a person to provide substantial assistance or support to any manufacturer, importer, or seller if that person knows or should have known that the manufacturer importer or seller is engaged in any act or practice that violates subsection A or B, and it goes on. So in other words, now there's, as the Chief Judge points out, there are many different kinds of legislation. It's not one size fits all. But this is certainly an example of a technical provision, a technical amendment, for which it is completely impossible to discern what it's doing or what it's about without the legislative history. But your last comments um, prompt the question. The, the textualist approach is also justified in terms of uh, limiting judicial activism and reining in judicial discretion. And I just ask you, in your view, um, does uh, the purpose, purpose of this approach versus the textualist approach, which is more likely to result in expansion of judicial discretion and judicial activism? Uh, which approach do you think leans to, to that side in reality? I mean, that's a, great, that's a great question. So in answering it directly, before answering it directly, I'd say it's in some ways the purpose of this, we're all purpose purpose of it, we're all textualists. I'm so we glad you're having problems with it, right. too. <laughs> we're all textualists in the sense that we start with, with the uh, text. I think that uh, the, uh, that purposivism, uh, if done correctly, can result in understanding the legislative process in a way that is truer to what Congress uh, had in mind than the uh, textualist approach where the language is, uh, especially where the language is, is, is ambiguous. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I think that, um, I mean, there is a view that um, in terms of interpreting um, statutes that uh, one should keep it modern and fresh and update it. That's not what I think we're supposed to do. I think we're supposed to look at what those who passed the legislation had, had in mind and um, to get a sense of what, what the purpose is. And, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, and so I think that both approaches can be, be useful, but when there's that ambiguity, I think uh, purposivism can be, can be helpful. Well, I mean, can, can Congress be perfect? Uh, if you uh, refuse to read beyond the words, um, why can't you just force Congress to do a better job, send it back and say, you know, get it right, or we can't make heads or tails out of this, you know, write it better. And that, that, that's the, there is that view that uh, let's, let's force Congress to, to, to be more precise. And uh, it, uh, you know, there, that's an, you know, something very attractive and seductive 
uh, about that. But sometimes uh, the, ambi the ambiguity in the law is, is a product of the legislature saying, here is a problem that we have identified. Uh, we think that the agencies should figure out how more precisely to uh, deal with the problem. Um, sometimes the, the ambiguity is, is a product of just the messiness of politics and trying to get craft a coalition together. Sometimes the ambiguity is, is, uh, is, 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 is a product of, of just uh, sloppy drafting. Um, all that is all that is is true, but um, the legislative process, as we know, is a uh, can be a very arduous process. Uh, and if if you can look at the legislation in the context of the materials associated with that legislative process, and it can they can be helpful, I think that's. That's a good thing. I mean, when you when you were in your days working on the Hill with uh, Senator Kennedy or Senator uh, Senator Moynihan, would you, if you were looking at a bill, uh, would you just ignore the the legislative history if if uh, if you were trying to understand if you were trying to make a recommendation to Senator Kennedy on what his view on a certain bill should be? I mean, as you point out in your book, the reason for legislative history is to, for those drafting the legislation to communicate with different constituencies. It's first and primarily to communicate with their colleagues for all the reasons you lay out. It may be that the bill is not apparent, as the Hobby Protection Act was, but there's other reasons, or they're communicating to the agencies who are the first interpreters, they have to implement it, or to the constituencies that want to understand the law, uh, and ultimately to the courts, uh, among others. So, no, I mean, it's very, very important. And also, we can take a weather eye. You know that if a solitary legislator is standing in an empty chamber making a statement that's not going to be challenged by another member, or maybe it has a little dot by in the congressional record, meaning that it's likely that the member, the senator, didn't even see the statement, that it was submitted for the record, and it wasn't stated. Those are entitled to very little weight. But a conference report, which accompanies the final bill, is entitled to great significance. The statement of a floor manager on the floor talking about the meaning when challenged by somebody else to explain it is entitled to some significance, I think. So this prompts a question, and I know you were putting me on the spot to see that I was paying attention here, but it, it which I am, because I'm enwrapped by all of this, but it prompts the following question. You don't take a one-size-fits-all approach. You employ what you describe in your book as a toolbox. You don't have a unified grand theory of statutory construction. And you, there's a very wonderful discussion of, of the usefulness of canons, which I commend to everybody, uh, sort of the canons of construction. But my point is, you, you say, and my question is, that you say that uh, it's so important to understand how Congress functions but not everybody has a PhD in political science. So how is the mere mortal, non-Katzmanian judge out there mm. going to be able to figure out what's the right tool to pull out of the toolbox? How can you know, most judges take your approach with some success? I think the, uh, uh, my, you know, my hope would be that, um, that a a judge can use some of these ideas, um, some of these tools. So the tools are um, looking at first the text, looking at uh, 
the statutory uh, structure? How do the pieces, you know, fit together in terms of the uh, uh, the bill, uh, understanding the bill, looking at uh, dictionaries uh, in limited ways? I that's a whole discussion uh, for another time because there's questions of what editions do you use? Uh, do members of Congress, do legislative staff, when they're drafting, do they use dictionaries? There are all sorts of questions there. Um, uh, looking at uh, scientific usages when it's a scientific statute, look at common law uh, uh, usages. Um, and so you, you look at all these tools and you say, I've got this statute, it's ambiguous. Um, which of these tools, how can these tools be made made to, to, to work for me. And I think it's a question of just, com it's really an exercise in common sense. And, uh, uh, and so I think that, that uh, it's um, just practice and, and experience. One, one of the things that uh, I suggest in the, uh, in the last chapter um, is, for uh, new judges to um, get some understanding about the workings of the legislative process, having uh, orientation seminars by <coughs> Congressional Research Service or the Library of Congress. There are some manuals that, are, that can be useful in understanding uh, the drafting process. Um, and similarly, uh, for uh, legislators having uh, an understanding of, and their staffs about the judicial process, having orientation seminars and sessions uh, for them. So I think that there are practical things that can be done to make the process more, you know, more more understandable and and concrete. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking of how I would answer if I put that question to myself. And as I was thinking about it, I also think that one of the things to rely on is what judges always rely on, which is the lawyers for the parties need to lay that out. I mean, right. it, it's not necessarily for the judge and the clerks to become, for this particular case, experts on the applicable. It's for the parties in the adversary process to lay out what's relevant. That's a great point. Absolutely yeah. true. And you can... And that's, and then that's why also... Uh, What's great, uh, this law school um, understanding legislation is important. Um, and if you take courses like the Good Professors course, uh, and you have an understanding, a better understanding of what the process of interpretation is all about, it will make you a better advocate, I think. Now, thinking about the role of, of lawyers in litigating and making the case before you, when I, I first turn to your chapter five, when you're talking about cases that you decided, I say, you know, it's somewhat, you, I mean, Justice Breyer has done it, but it, and others have done it, but it, it's a little bit unusual for a sitting judge to be writing about cases that you've decided. So I'm just asking you in doing that, and you did it in the most even-handed, straightforward, unobjectionable way, we'll stipulate that. But as you're writing it, are there any limitations or constraints you put in yourself and anything you have in mind. And also, it strikes that anything that's written by an extremely important, influential jurist runs the danger of what happened to Fred Hargadon, who was the dean of admissions at Princeton, where he was appearing with potential applicants and their families, and he let slip uh, that the Princeton Orchestra was short of oboe players. Uh, and the following year, suddenly everybody who was applying seemed to be an oboe player, right? So, you know, you might have some impact in, in uh, getting your advocacy skewed a little bit towards your point of view. Uh, but uh, I lost the thread of my own question there. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what kind of limitations or, or, or benchmarks are you just let it all hang well, out? I, 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 uh, I wanted to, to, to uh, basically, write it in such a way that um, I, in a case, let's say that I, I lost, uh, 
was an opinion that was reversed. Um, I did not uh, try to criticize the Supreme Court's decision. I just laid it out. And my idea was that if I could, could be very honest and even-handed in presenting the course of statutory interpretation, beginning at the beginning, come, going to the Court of Appeals, where I would write the decision, and then laying out what the Supreme Court did, you as the reader could be the judge. Um, I, it's not at all defensive, uh, quite, quite uh, deliberately, and, uh, and the lawyers can make their own judgment. So if I were writing, if I were the uh, uh, writing, uh, if I were the judge in Buckley versus Vallejo and my view was, was not accepted by the Supreme Court, I would hope that, that, uh, that Professor Agora would read it and say, well, this was a fair presentation of the view. And that's, that, was, that was sort of my, my aspiration, was to write something that uh, even, uh, even somebody who disagreed with me would say, well, that's very fair. And I, you know, it, because I don't really think it's appropriate for a judge after the fact uh, to say, uh, you know, I was right and you were wrong. I mean, it's, we work in a, we work in a, we work in a system which we should respect. You know, I do the best I can, the Supreme Court does the best it can, and uh, that's, how it, that's how it goes. You, you know, sometimes your views are accepted, sometimes they're not, but I appreciate the hard work they put into their decision-making process, and I don't really question that. Well, one of the things that really comes out of your book is, is your deep respect and, I believe, admiration for the entire system of government and all those who are engaged in it. And as an example of sort of the intellectual honesty I was talking about and also uh, the diligence, uh, it just it's striking that uh, in sort of in passing, um, the author mentions that in preparing uh, an opinion, he wrote it the other way, I guess to sharpen his thinking. You know, so he wrote it both ways and then you know, picked uh, the approach that he thought made the most sense, which I thought was a remarkable, you know, it was sort of mentioned in passing, but a remarkable tribute to you, really, into the integrity of our, our process. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Changing gears just a little bit, uh, you, you really have, much broader than the subject that we're talking about, always been engaged in improving government. And that's, I think, what led you to champion and cause uh, the creation of the Immigration Justice Corps, which is very near and dear. I know you know Professor Kaplow here, our uh, Associate Dean for Professional Education from that experience. And uh, we have at least two uh, of our students, uh, Ping Poon, who's uh, class of 15 and graduated as a fellow, and uh, uh, Paolo Uriarte, uh, class of 14, who's still, she's a graduate, uh, and she's uh, a fellow. Uh, what, uh, tell us a little bit more, because I don't think everybody in the audience probably knows about this uh, core and how you've been involved and what it's trying to accomplish. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, uh, when I became a judge in 1999, the uh, number of uh, immigration cases that we saw were just minuscule. It was something like 2% uh, of our docket. And then um, after, uh, especially after 9-11 and the concern, understandable concern about who was here legitimately and who wasn't here uh, legitimately, the uh, docket of the Second Circuit at one point went to 40% immigration cases. It's now down in the uh, 20s. But um, what we saw in case after case was uh, cases of, um, of, of, of really poor lawyering. And um, in a lot of these cases, we had the sense that if only there was a, uh, a good lawyer, the outcome might have been different. And I'm not talking about uh, cases where there's been criminal violations. I'm talking about cases where uh, 
you know, like your grandparents, people who are here for a long time, or your great grandparents, um, and uh, law abiding citizens, uh, children who, uh, who are honor students. Uh, and um, as we uh, peeled back the, as I peeled back the layer, what I realized that the problem wasn't so much the bad lawyering. The problem often was that uh, there was no lawyering at the very outset of the process. And if you don't have a good lawyer at the very outset of the process, your chances are, are, are doomed. And um, so um, that led me to, uh, with some tremendous uh, people, uh, including uh, Professor Kaplow and uh, Sarah Burr, who is here with us, an immigration, or a retired immigration judge of, of great distinction, uh, to work on a study group uh, that um, has, has produced a number of different uh, reports. And, and, and uh, uh, Senator Moynihan used to say, uh, as you know, you're entitled to your own uh, opinion, but not to your own facts. And so the, the idea was to get, gather the data. And uh, what we found was really quite remarkable. In New York, if you had a lawyer in an asylum type case, 74% of the time, you would have a successful outcome, 74%. If you didn't have a lawyer, it was something like 13%. Um, so our interest wasn't in dictating the outcome, but in at least providing a level playing field. It's in the interest of government to have good lawyers. It makes things a lot uh, easier in terms of the process. It's in the interest of the judges to um, have good lawyers. Uh, it's in everyone's interest, not just the, uh, the immigrants. So the uh, Immigrant Justice Corps idea is one of the products of, of uh, this work. And um, the notion is to uh, train uh, lawyers uh, in immigration law. Uh, and uh, this is the, the nation's first program wholly dedicated to the training of lawyers uh, who will work in immigration law uh, and um, really to um, assist those of uh, no or moderate means so that they can have their day in court. They may not be successful, but the American system of justice is always better if there is some level playing field in terms of, of equality of advocacy. It's an extremely uh, competitive program. And uh, the two Brooklyn uh, law school students who have uh, been awarded uh, this fellowship are in great company. They're in the company of uh, the best uh, law school graduates uh, in the country. Uh, and um, it's a very elite group of, of people. And so uh, they are going to be uh, leaders in this field and in their uh, profession. Um, and uh, uh, they're working on asylum cases, on detained cases. Um, and that's, that's, that's also uh, another issue that's uh, uh, in need of, of further work. And so I'm very proud of these young lawyers and of, of um, the study group of, of the community of which Brooklyn Law School has been a very important part in thinking through these uh, issues. And uh, we uh, uh, have a lot of uh, people behind us, the support of several foundations, including the Robin Hood Foundation, the JPB Foundation, the uh, Leon Levy Foundation. If uh, one of your uh, 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 graduates, uh, Robert Kaufman, is... Uh, he sends uh, his regards, by the way. He, he, He's he, uh, had he, a friend pass away, so he was not able, he intended to be here tonight. Uh, Robert Kaufman uh, got um, some settlement out of the uh, 
from the, the banks uh, flowing from the Holocaust litigation. And uh, he's used that pot of money to do good things for other people, not for himself. And he uh, uh, made a donation to the Immigrant Justice Corps, of which we're very um, appreciative. And uh, so um, I'm looking forward to continuing to, to work together with Brooklyn Law School on this very uh, exciting initiative. Well, thank you. You know, your work in that area, uh, to use a Latin phrase, is a real mitzvah. And uh, we really uh, deeply appreciate your leadership. Uh, I mentioned to Bob Kaufman uh, uh, that you uh, referenced his contribution as well. So I just very quickly, I'm going to open this up briefly uh, for questions. And then we'll have an opportunity, you know, over uh, hors d'oeuvres and some wine uh, for you to have questions and to buy books, uh, those of you who aren't students. Uh, but I just very quickly ask you just two uh, questions in concluding. Uh, one is, you know, you've written so beautifully in your book about the grand symphonic music of the interplay of our incredible democratic republic the way it's been established, which is the most enduring in history. So looking at it now, are you an optimist or a pessimist about its future? <laughs> That's question number one, all right? And then question number two, which I'll give you and you can answer both of them at once. What advice would you give to our students uh, as they prepare to go out and become lawyers? I think as to the first question, I am I am definitely an optimist. I mean, I think that uh, uh, that as a country, uh, whatever challenges we've had, uh, I know that sounds Pollyannish, but I really believe that we find a way out of whatever challenges we have to to meet them. And uh, so I'm 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 hopeful about our our meeting those challenges. I think that our fundamental governmental system is strong. There are obviously problems, but uh, I think I'm hopeful that good things can will, will, will happen. And as to advice to uh, law students, uh, generally what I would say is um, follow, follow your passions. Uh, I mean, that's, that may seem sort of uh, trite, but uh, you went into the legal profession for a reason. You're, you're in law school, something moved you to go to law school. And if, if it's something that you really care about, uh, pursue it. And, and life is full of ups and downs. Uh, so even if uh, on the way to do the things that you're passionate about, you've got to do other things, uh, don't let go of that which uh, you have that passion for. And uh, over the totality of your life, uh, with some luck always involved, uh, you'll be able to do those things. And I think that, um, uh, and also I'd say, in whatever you do, um, leave some time to do some good for others, uh, whether it's pro bono or helping helping other people. Uh, and that's, I think, that's what makes this legal profession a noble profession, is that it's not just about uh, serving ourselves, but serving, serving others. Well, thank you. Good advice. Who has a question? was cases that you lost, cases that you lost as the writer of the opinion, I presume. And my question is, do you keep a scorecard? <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a scorecard. I mean, I, I, and I shouldn't, I mean, loss is sort of a, uh, is, is just a shorthand for where cases didn't go the way that I would have liked given that I was reversed, but uh, it's, 
I don't have a scorecard yet. As, as you asked me the question, I, I could probably, you know, instantly tell you what my one loss record is in terms of, so, so in, in, as I say, I, I don't actually take a scorecard of yet. I suppose I, you know, in a sense that I, I do. Following up that question, what are your feelings when you lose a case? When, when the Supreme Court reverses, I actually uh, sort of take it in stride because, uh, you know, it could be that they're actually correct, you know. So I'm not, you know, one who is, who is, who, who says because I wrote, I wrote this opinion that it has to be right. And so I, uh, uh, you know, of course you're disappointed. You did, you know, your your first reaction is 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 disappointment. Uh, but at the same time, I so much respect what each of those justices is trying to do that. Uh, and, and as, as long, and one of the things I think, it, it, and when this, things often, fortunately, have gone in terms of affirmance, and so the fact that there are affirmances sort of tempers the um, the uh, reversals. And um, I have to say that one of the things that I've really appreciated in the uh, tenor of the Supreme Court opinions is that. They're never, uh, they've never been uh, personal to, to the panel. It's always been really, uh, here is the law, here is how we agree, here is how we differ. Um, and I think that um, that's a tone that I very much uh, you know, appreciate. Because words can woo, you know, words. You, will, you have the power to, when you write, you have the power to really uh, affect sensibilities. And uh, so tone and rationale in the writing of opinions is important. And the, those that I've had dealing with my opinions have been just right, even if they didn't agree with me. And then a question right up front here. Yeah, go ahead. So and here's the mic. members of Congress disagreeing about what the actual purpose of legislation was. And just one example, let's take civil rights act, for example, you could have for sure two Republicans that are thinking that it's uh, you, you, it's supposed to not be overly regulatory on, on, on businesses and then you can have the Humphrey Democrats thinking that it's a really anti-supportive nation measure. So when it comes to something like disparate impact and whether or not that's something that's covered in the civil rights act, how did, when there's, based on the, when the language says one thing, it's like two different sides that are disagreeing that are equally as important to getting the legislation passed. How did they judge and approach that? It's, it's why I say you have to approach the task with, with humility. Um, and in a way, you just do the best you can. Um, the, 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 the Shepsley, Ken Shepsley's view that Congress is a, uh, is, is a they, not an if, is, is true. Uh, in, 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 in some important sense. But at the same time, um, as Justice Breyer points out uh, in his, his writings, that um, we try to, uh, if we can, uh, we do, we ascribe where we can, what is the overarching, what is, what is going on in this legislation. Um, in the particular case, it can be very, very difficult for the reasons that, that you note, know, that looking at that legislative history makes things, can make things sometimes even more difficult. Um, but in the context of a specific case, uh, you try to um, sift from what's in that, what's in those materials, what can be, be useful and, and I'm glad you asked the question because it highlights the complexity of the, of the task. And I talk about that in the book. Yeah, you do. You point out in uh, the footnote that you have about Justice Breyer's book, how Justice Breyer says it's the effort 
to pursue the purpose that is most likely to avoid substituting the judicial will for the legislative will, realizing that it's not perfect and it's hard. Uh, so uh, That's a much better answer than I gave. Thank you. <laughs> well, I didn't mean that. But it, I got it from you. I was cribbing from your no. uh, book. I read your book. Well, that's, that's the only reason I knew. Uh, Professor Kaiser, who also teaches statutory interpretation, so be careful. Oh. <laughs> Does it make sense to contextualize the use of legislative history? So we might argue that uh, how we use legislative history depends on the type of text. So uh, in the Brushman Bluff article that you mentioned, there's some evidence that congressional members uh, don't pay much attention to legislative history when it comes to omnibus passes. But for appropriations where we have rules about what we can put in the text of the statute, that's where legislative history comes into play. And you might also argue that uh, how we use legislative history uh, could differ uh, across types of statutes. So if we have a labor statute, we might look at how the legislative history uh, confirms interest group rights. Or if we're looking to a tax statute, we might see that the tax lighting committee is, uh, is providing a lot of expertise. Uh, so your thoughts on that? I, I think that, that that context is important, and um, un one of the reasons that understanding the legislative process is important is that it leads you to different kinds of interpretation. Um, so when you're dealing with, uh, with, a, with the tax committees, legislation coming out of tax committees, there, there are a whole series of, as you know, protocols and how legislation is, is written. And so understanding that can be very, very, very useful. And obviously you can't do that for every committee of Congress, it would be too much, but there's certain major committees where you can do that and trying to understand context can be, can be important. Great, okay. We're gonna take two more questions, very quickly though, and then get to the uh, appetizers and wine for conversation. So yeah. Judge, in terms of the administrative agencies and their expertise, to what role, have, well I guess perfect for both, I haven't read it, but to what extent does that influence Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, well, to what extent does that influence the judge's opinions? Because especially, I would think when you have an administration contrary to Congress, where you may have different that's a great question. And so, um, as you know, the court has uh, created a doctrine, the Chevron Doctrine. And the Chevron Doctrine basically says that where the statute is ambiguous, that uh, courts will uh, uh, defer to the agency's interpretation as long as the interpretation is reasonable. Now that has been modified to some extent, and this is one of the key, perhaps doctrinal uh, lessons coming out of, of uh, King v. Burwell, is what the court says very importantly uh, in that case is where the issue is so significant it's for the, the courts will not will not uh, automatically defer, and so I think as we think about the development of of, uh, of administrative law over the next decade, that's going to be really the key thing to look at. How does that do those words in that in the in, in the uh, Chief Justice opinion? How did how will they be understood in terms of what the court's role in interpreting uh, what agencies do? How much deference, is, deference should they give to an agency? When did they decide that something, what's the criteria for deciding when is something too important to be left to uh, just the, the agencies? Great, and the final question is my student, Ethel. So it seems like when it's a difficult question, judges often vote along with their like political leanings. So I was just wondering, what tools do you have to like separate your own personal biases? And also, um, when you look at statutes, do you look at the the party that controls like passed the statute, or how 
how much weight do you give to this factor in poetry? I would uh, respectfully disagree with your view that um, that judges are uh, you know follow their or follow their their political preferences and. Uh, you could look at recent cases of the Supreme Court where you would say, you know, that justice probably, if that justice or that judge were in a legislature, might vote differently um, from the way that he or she is coming out in a case. So I don't, uh, and, and I've had now 16 years of experience on an appellate court, and um, uh, I'm struck by how uh, that kind of partisanship that you're talking about isn't really, isn't really present. And when I read uh, newspaper articles that describe, you know, judge so and so, a Democratic appointee or a Republican appointee, I think that's such a uh, distortion. I mean, that's a factual, tr factually true, but it, it it should not lead to the view that. Uh, if this person is a Democratic appointee or a Republican appointee, that's how she's going to vote as a judge. I, I, I just don't see that. Um, um, you know, obviously, there is a, a, a small percentage of cases where, um, on an appellate court, where there are differences, and obviously, worldview can come into it. But it's not a partisan perspective that that separates how. How the diff that makes people differ as judges and decision makers. So, Chief Judge Robert Kaufman, you have given us all of us a reason to be an optimist about the future of our government. And as somebody who is a leader in the third branch, it's obvious that you not only judge well, but that you're a good judge and a good man. And we thank you for your leadership. We thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank you.